If you missed part one in this two-part series, be sure and check it out. In part one, I covered how to validate a working magnetic motor, how to tell if your motor shows progress, as well as how to invalidate some of the fakes. In part two, I'll be covering how to protect your proprietary rights should you invent a magnetic motor, and why I believe it's possible to build one. If you'd like to see this two-part series in one video, visit my Rumble backup channel at the URL above. If you haven't already, visit my other YouTube channel that features interesting topics that wouldn't always fit the subject matter on this one. And for my more controversial videos, visit me at the URL above. Protecting your proprietary rights. The U.S. Patent Office does not grant patents to so-called perpetual motion machines. Magnetic motors that run without an electromagnetic assist from a battery or other methods fall into this category. Years ago, Joseph Newman and Howard Johnson both went through lengthy legal battles to procure patents on their inventions. Howard Johnson went to the extent of writing a personal letter to then-President Jimmy Carter who contacted the head of the patent office in his behalf, and he was finally granted a patent. Not everyone has the advantage of having served on the Atomic Energy Commission or being offered head of encryption for the U.S. Navy on the resume to get the intention of a sitting president, though. More problematic is the fact that the U.S. Congress passed the Invention Secrecy Act in 1952. The U.S. government categorizes many alternative energy devices as a danger to national defense something that could potentially threaten an existing technology that is tightly tied into the economy of the nation easily falls into that category. One of the more troubling provisions of this bill isn't just that it entitles the government to seize your property, but after you file for a patent, if you, as inventor of your magnetic motor or alternative energy device, decide to publicly release information on your invention or to patent it in another country, you could be fined up to $10,000 in prison for up to two years, or both. So if you happen to invent an innovative, new alternative energy device and file for a patent, the U.S. government can seize your technology without compensating you and remove your patent rights. The only way around this is to forego patent protection. I point all this out not to discourage you, but to inform you. Only you, as the inventor of your device, can determine the correct method to protect your invention. So what I'm about to lay out should only be taken as suggestions and not as legal advice on how to protect your proprietary rights, as I'm not a lawyer. To get around the Invention Secrecy Act, you could choose to patent your invention in another country and forego the U.S. patent, which many inventors do. If you don't care about money and simply want to improve the world, you could choose to open source your work and share it with the world. That enables more people to build and improve on your designs and for information to be more easily spread to the public. You could also go an entirely different route. When you film your own content, including something you've invented and you upload it to YouTube or other platforms like Rumble, you already have a copyright on your work. I'd suggest placing important content on both platforms as Rumble allows you to retain rights on their platform and exclude YouTube so that you may also hold a YouTube copyright. It's also difficult, if not impossible, to make something go away once there are multiple copies of it online in various places. So it's a good idea to upload your videos to multiple platforms and suggest that people share them and even request that they make copies themselves so that if yours ever go down, they can distribute them themselves so long as they don't monetize them and profit off of your content. You may also wish to place design schematics of your work with a detailed explanation of how your device works in a small book format and copyright it as you would a book. Even if your device isn't something you believe would fall under the Invention Secrecy Act provision, another thing to consider is that a design patent only lasts for 15 years. So, from design, to research and development, to marketing and sales of your invention, you only have a 15-year window before your patent expires. On the other hand, any copyright filed after 1978 lasts for the life of its creator, plus an additional 70 years. Just something to consider. And just to be clear, I'm not suggesting you choose between copywriting an invention as you might a book, or featuring the invention to YouTube to copyright the content that way. I'm suggesting you do both. Why it's possible to build a magnetic motor. 
One of the things I hear most commonly said about magnetic motors from the self-appointed physics police that usually consist of college graduates who took some basic science courses is, you can't build a magnetic motor because it would violate the laws of thermodynamics. I disagree, mainly because the textbook understanding of magnets is simply wrong. Allow me to clarify. Working with Dr. Gerard Bayer, professor of chemical engineering at Virginia Tech, and electrical engineer Stephen Davis, Howard Johnson developed specialized magnetic field mapping technology. This integrated a type of sonar equipment to map the most accurate images of magnetic fields ever recorded. With this technology, Johnson discovered and mapped spin vortices. By using a complex arrangement of magnets composed of various magnetic materials, he discovered a way to trigger an exchange force pulse when one set of magnets on a cart or rotor would pass by a specific arrangement of magnets composed of different materials on a stator or track. This could momentarily flip spins of certain magnets and resulted in a pole flip that would trigger an exchange force pulse roughly four to 500 times the normal strength of the magnet. Johnson discovered this method of spin flipping because he believed from his earlier studies that there was a previously undiscovered electron that influenced magnetic fields. That was the basis of much of his research in magnetics and what led him to discover and map spin vortices. This isn't something you'd learn about in standard college textbooks on magnetics or physics, which is why there's a clear misunderstanding on how the laws of thermodynamics apply to magnetic motive force systems. Richard Feynman put it this way, it is not possible to understand the magnetic effects of materials in any honest way from the point of view of classical physics. Such magnetic effects are completely quantum mechanical phenomena. Tesla perhaps said it best, it is a mere question of time when men will succeed in attaching their machinery to the very wheelwork of nature. One misconception I've noticed from people tinkering with magnetic motors is some of them equate a magnet to a battery or assume it contains some sort of internal power. Clearly that's incorrect. A magnet is nothing more than an object that's been electrically charged to create an invisible magnetic field of electrons around that object. It's only when you begin to experiment with and alter the spin vortices of different magnetic materials that the magnet may be utilized to make use of the electrons. It's similar in some respects to how a sailboat rides the wind. The wind is a force of nature, as electrons are part of the wheelwork of nature. But there's nothing magical about the sail, nor the materials the magnet is composed of. They're both tools to harness what's already there in abundance. To that point, it's more useful to look at the electron than the magnet. To fully understand the electron, you have to enter the quantum field of mechanics, and that's when things get strange. Here's a couple of examples of answers provided by physics professors when asked if electrons are everywhere at once. Quantum mechanics is very subtle. It is more correct to say that there is some probability of detecting an electron anywhere. This probability is near zero, far away from its previous location. The electron doesn't have a position until it is detected. Because of quantum uncertainty principle, electrons cannot be entirely stopped. If an electron were exactly at rest, the uncertainty in its velocity would be zero, implying an infinite uncertainty in its position. Such an extreme state can be approached, but never really attained. Take that one step further and consider the double slit experiment. Many people have heard of this experiment, but for those who haven't, briefly, some scientists did an experiment where they fired electrons through a slit, which produced a single band of electrons on the back wall. Then they fired electrons through a double slit, which provided a wave pattern. Baffled by this, they decided to place a device by the entrance of the slits to observe which slit the electrons were going through when they were fired. When they observed the electrons being fired through the slits, the electrons behaved differently, creating two bands on the wall instead of the wave pattern. The very act of observing the electrons caused them to behave differently. For those who believe magnetic motive force systems would violate physics, I simply suggest you look at quantum physics for further understanding, as this is the area of physics that magnetic motive force systems will be correctly understood. Consider as well that we are surrounded by common occurrences in our everyday lives that we were told were impossible just a few short years ago.
Remember their words every time somebody tells you something is impossible or violates the laws of physics. Thanks for watching and do great things.